Welcome to episode 72, The Science of Intuition, Appreciating Its Influence, by Lori Tortkoff Hops, Licensed Clinical Psychologist. From Clearly Clinical, learn, grow, shine. everyone, and welcome to Clearly Clinical's podcast on the science of intuition for mental health practitioners. I'm your host for the next hour, Lori Chortkoff hops I'm a licensed psychologist in Westlake Village, California, USA, a certified Reiki master, and I hold a diploma in comprehensive energy psychology. I received my master's and PhD from, in clinical psychology from the University of Houston in Texas in the USA and I use intuitive work in my professional practice and in my personal life since I was a child. I'm also going to be president-elect 2020 for the Comprehensive Energy Psychology Association called ACEP, and you can find out more about them at www.energypsych.org. Thank you so much for Clearly Clinical and for all the people and events that have brought us together to learn about this interesting topic of intuition. We learned together today there's going to be two main objectives. One of them is to describe two ways in which intuitive abilities are part of human nature, and the other is to name two findings from peer-reviewed research studies on intuition, and we'll be going over many more than just two of each of these. But before we begin, I want you to understand that you may be seeing and hearing some things that are new to you and that might be surprising or unusual. And so some things that you might want to think about while you're confronting new material are the four stages of paradigm change that lead to an openness to new ideas. For example, you may have something new that comes to you that surprises you, and that might be an aha experience. It could be seeing something in a new way or learning about something that you hadn't learned before, or even seeing something in your physical life that surprises you. Maybe having an unusual experience with alterations in time or association. But usually if we're not too shut down about those things, we want to learn more. And so we investigate. And we do this as individuals and as a society, too, when we're learning something new about our culture or about science. After you investigate to learn more, then you start to apply new knowledge to see how does this work. And you can think about that as like the baby who's dropping the spoon off the high chair for the first time and seeing it bounce and clatter and you want to find out more about this experience. What does this mean in your life? But the same can be true about intuitive experiences. And then finally, you create a community around those new approaches so that they aren't new so much anymore and you begin to learn more along with your community. So for the purposes of our time together, we're going to define intuition as the ability to understand or know something immediately without conscious reasoning. That's taken from the Compact Oxford Oxford English Dictionary of Current English in 2005. Also, you could say that intuition is a natural feedback system between the conscious and unconscious mind, which allows for protection and growth of the individual. So this is an early warning system that we have in our bodies, minds, and spirits to alert us to danger and also as to what we should move towards, for example, growth or interaction or procreation. And so it's kind of like a yes-no system of do I move forward and approach or do I move back and protect? And this usually works without our awareness until we confront something that's unusual or unexpected, and then we have to figure out what's really going on here. So I'm going to tell you a little story that demonstrates this in the modern setting. So back in 1985, there was a very important piece of art, a sculpture, that came to the attention of the J. Paul Getty Museum. And it was a nude youth who was standing, statue, and it was supposed to represent the notion of youth. And the question to the experts that looked at this statue were twofold. One of them is, is this real, a real authentic statue that has value and is a true ancient relic, or is it a forgery, a modern forgery? And so different experts saw it from around the world, and they all had different opinions. Now, some people thought that it was authentic because 
of the way that it was formed and the rock that was used and because of the price, it was going to be purchased for $9 million. Others thought, no, this is completely a fake. In fact, it's a good forgery, but it's a modern forgery. And they saw things like that the hairstyle was ancient, but the sh shoulders were too narrow. And that it had a, more of a slender waist than is usual for um, statues that were dated around 530 before the Common Era. Also, the incision between the toes and the buttocks all seemed to be very modern. And people just couldn't figure out, is this real or not? So I actually saw this statue not knowing about it. I went to the museum many years ago, and I was looking around the room, and the statue was in the middle, and I thought, what's that? fake modern statue doing in the middle of this museum. And I can't tell you why I thought that. The color was a little bit off. It was like a pearly pink and it just didn't seem, I don't know, authentic. Um, some of the experts also said that when they walked up to the statue for the first time, that the first thing that they thought of in their mind was the word fresh. And fresh is not something that you think of when you look at a statue that's supposed to be ancient. So this is an example of many different types of intuition that have come together at once, and I'm going to use it as an example to talk about some of the research findings that we have uh, around intuition. And so you may be thinking about some experiences you've had in the past that are similar, where you just don't quite know why you know something, but you know it to be true, and you can't really talk about it in ways that make sense, that are obvious. So this notion that information can come to us up from the body and into the brain is reflected in a theory called the Embody Experience Theory. And you can learn more about some of these theories through the book Clinical Intuition and Psychotherapy by Terry Marks Tarlow, published in 2012. The Embodied Experience Theory says that through our body awareness, through our primary senses of taste, touch, smell, and sight, and feeling, and perceptions, that we understand information directly from the environment and our perceptions into the body, and then the body signals the brain to let us understand what we're going through. And only after the brain wakes up do we have associations, judgments, perceptions, and the ability to use the information to make decisions in the world. So it's the body that's the prime mover that synchronizes and resonates with emotion of information with self and others. And some of the parts of the brain that take the information from the body are memory locations, like the procedural and sensory motor parts of the brain, like you would have for walking, things that you've learned a long time ago that you don't really think about that are natural and easy for you. And so those are the parts of the brain, along with emotional and interpersonal aspects that give you information about intuition. Another theory is called implicit knowledge theory. And this says that intuition is something that we're born with. It turns on around the third trimester, uh, prenatally, be before the baby's born. And it's not a conscious form of learning. It also is in the subcortical regions of the brain. So this is another bottom-up processing model, meaning that it goes from the body up to the brain rather than the other way around. And this sort of learning is automatic, fast, and effortless. And it goes very quickly. We don't know why we're picking up on something, but we react almost like the way you pull your hand away from a hot stove before knowing that you're even touching the heat. Your body's already reacting to intuitive knowledge. And there's a bunch of studies that have found this to be true more than just a theory. So research that was done in 2012 to 2016 show that the body knows the difference between intuitive guesses that are accurate and inaccurate. And most of this stuff is outside of our common everyday awareness. We also can't talk about it usually because it's in the nonverbal regions of the brain. And so what these researchers found, Mossbridge uh, the Group, McCready and Atkinson, Horror and Salvi, all from 2012 to 2016, that when people are given experiences about guessing between something that's true and something that isn't, 
that the body is already telling you the truth about it before your brain even is has been exposed to the material or has any way of processing it. Also, the orbital frontal cortex registers these aha experiences via four other parts of the brain with problem-solving tasks from the Zander and Hoare uh, research studies. So there were 26 studies that were uh, brought together in a meta-analysis from 1978 to 2010, and they show that the body was reacting between 1 and 10 seconds before being exposed to a stimulus in the lab, like guessing the outcome of a roulette game. So imagine this, you're a subject in the lab, you're being shown a roulette game, and you're going to be told, um, you're going to see where the little piece lands in the roulette wheel. And before, this, the, um, before that round even starts, your body is already figuring out whether you're going to guess accurately or not to the answer. So you see it spin, and then you're like, yes, I was right. It was going to be on a black number four or on a red number 12. And you're either right or wrong in your guess. But your body already knew ahead of time, before you guessed, whether you were going to guess correctly or incorrectly. And they're measuring things like heart rate, blood volume, pupil dilation, EEG and EMG, and blood oxygenation. So these statistical uh, uh, studies were found to be highly significant, like to 10 to, the 10, 10 to the 8th, 10 to the 12th power of probability, but the effect size or the overall power of the effects was um, a small effect. So in other words, these were highly unlikely to be chance findings, but they weren't a very strong finding overall in terms of um, how much of the variance in your body reaction was accounted for by your predictions. So these studies were re-examined in January 2008 to June 2018, and they found 19 new peer and non-peer reviewed studies with 26 experiments and 36 effect sizes. Similar measurements, um, although this time they didn't look at the psychophysiology and neurophysiology both before and after the experiments, only those that were um, those effects in the body before the guessing. And they found a little bit higher um, effect sizes of 0.28, where the other studies were at 0.21, but still very high levels of um, significance. So the body is registering information before you even know what you're going to be doing on a conscious level. So another group of research is the bridge between the conscious and unconscious experience. And the idea here is that intuition arises suddenly without conscious mediation of logic or rational process. And so what this says, kind of like the statue experiment with is this a real or a fake statue in terms of is it a real authentic ancient finding or is it something that's a modern forgery, People reach a decision about it, but they don't, can't really explain how they came to it. It just sort of comes to them all at once. And this is stored in nonverbal representations, like images, feelings, physical sensations, and metaphors. So this is often what we see with clients, is that they'll have a sense of something, like a relationship that's right for them or not, or something based on a dream or a hunch. And you try to explore more, like, well, how did you know to go or not go with these people or to have this job or that job or to decide what to say in the situation or not? And people often just say, I don't know, I felt it in my gut or I just had a sense or it seemed the right thing to do or I knew to be quiet and to wait. I knew not to turn left at that moment even though the light was green because I felt like something bad was going to happen and then right away a car came barreling through the intersection so these things happen and we aren't quite sure what's going on, but they stem from the unconscious awareness, which takes on a lot more information than the conscious brain. And so one of the quotes is that um, the, the conscious brain and the unconscious brain work differently and they have different ways of talking and learning. And so they say, the voice of the spirit only speaks once and the voice of the mind never shuts up.
it goes on and on and on, debating and thinking and all of that. Now, there's some other studies that have been done in the lab that show that the heart actually responds to the environment first and then signals the brain. So we usually don't think about this in Western culture. We usually think that we lead with our minds, we lead with our notions, we lead with our perceptions and cognitions. And we aren't paying as much attention to the heart or living from the heart. But the heart has the largest electromagnetic signal of the body and it sends out waves that go many, many feet beyond the body. And this heart information is collecting and metabolizing information from within the self and outside to the environment in these recursive cir uh, circles and paths. That information is then brought up to the brain and the brain then alerts the rest of the body outside the heart without conscious awareness that something is uh, important to pay attention to. Only then does the self say, oh, my body's reacting like I'm getting chills, or my stomach is tight, or I feel nauseous, or I'm excited suddenly, or my heart is beating fast, and then I wonder what that is due to, and then you start paying attention to things inside and outside yourself to get meaning in the world. So that's the psychophysiological studies that are showing that the heart, amongst other things, are reacting to information first before the brain. And then there's some lab studies that look at language association and cognitive learning theory. And these studies are straight out of the lab. They are not real world uh, simulations. Um, and mostly what they're formed on is language association tasks or learning tasks. So what you do is you have a string of words, let's say, that you're supposed to see, like, what is the grammar behind how they're put together? Or if you're given three words in a sequence, what's the fourth word that ties them together with meaning? For example, foam, green, wet. And then the fourth word would be water. So water can be foamy, green, and wet. And then you get three more words and you try to discover what the fourth word is. So those are a couple of examples of um, learning lists, learning words, learning associations. And then the most... Um, dramatic uh, story is one I'll say for you for a moment that happened that kind of created quite a stir in the um, intuition and research uh, literature. So basically the, the main uh, standard tests that they do in these labs um, find that there's two different ways of learning and one of them is um, if you've had a prior experience with something that you're more likely to understand something subsequently after the fact. So if you've already learned a list of words that are related to food, then the next list of words you say, well, maybe they're related to beverages or to animals. So you already have like a category in your mind and you learn faster and make faster associations. So that's kind of the gradual exposure model and that's called priming. And then the other type is called intuition uh, at least in these labs, and that is where an idea suddenly comes fully formed all at once, and you're not aware of having prior experience with it. So you may have those lists of words, and you don't know that they're supposed to be tied to a new idea, but it suddenly dawns on you that this is a list of um, animals or planets, and so you're able to talk about it in a way that you wouldn't have if you hadn't thought about them being related to a common construct. So both of those priming and intuition methods use prior experience to reach conclusions that are not fully conscious. But the intuition goes past, beyond past data and uses associative memories and clues, and cues rather. So the cool study that was found, that was done, was with Daryl Bem's research group. And he's a um, laboratory psychologist who's been around for years and has a long um, history of having very uh, robust and interesting and well thought of and respected uh, research. Well, he came along and did some research with lists of um, words. So this is what would happen. Subject comes into the laboratory and sees a list of words that they need to look at quickly and then write down as many words as they can remember. And they've never seen this list before. Then, in the next part of the experiment, those same people have another list of words. 
Now, some of the words in list two were also in list one. Then you take list two and you try to really study it. So whereas with the first list, you just saw it once and then tried to write down what you saw, list two, you're really, really studying. You're trying to memorize it as much as possible. And then they see how many of those words did you memorize from list two. Now here's the thing that they found. They found that the words that you were going to be studying on list two, you were more likely to remember the first time you saw them. So this is retrocausation. This is time moving backward. This is that an event that is about to happen is influencing something in the past. So the words, let's say there's the word um, laptop red tissue are on the first list. And those words are also on the second list. Those words are going to be more easily remembered the first time you see laptop red and tissue if you're going to be studying them in the second round of the experiment. So this created, as you can imagine, quite a stir in the psychological community because what you're basically saying is that the future is affecting the past, that time doesn't just run forward. We're used to the normal rhythm of if you study something, then you're better at it later on. But not that if you study something soon, you're going to be better at it before you see it. And so um, people thought that the research was flawed, that they were faking the data, that their assumptions were wrong, but this is shown to be something that is real and that does happen, and it changes our perception of how we take in information and what we can learn about our future. So this can happen sometimes with a dream, that information can come to you in a dream that tells you something about your future, and then you behave differently based upon it or you think differently based upon it. So Mossbridge and Radin uh, did uh, publish an article in 2018. It was a comment on the state of the art of precognition, which is knowing something ahead of time or seeing one's future. And they talk about this as prospection. And they reviewed studies on precognitive dreaming, which is knowing events before they happen through the dreams. And then also being able to predict things in the lab, like a forced choice answer, like, for example, um, knowing the right answer to a question that's going to be asked and you don't know what that question is. Also trying to judge ahead of time a free response, for example, something that doesn't have a clear cut answer. For example, someone might say, um, tell us the best things about rubber bands. And then someone writes an essay on that. And then you come into the lab not knowing anything, and they said, someone wrote an essay. What do you think it's about? And clearly, you know, it's not like saying rubber bands are good or bad. They could have written anything about rubber bands, but you're able to pick up on what they had said in the essay. Then the thing that they also reviewed was the research on Daryl Bem's 2011 study of uh, future practice of word recalls affecting present performance, which is called implicit precognition. And then finally, they also re review the studies that we talked about already about presentiment, which is when the body can tell what's going on in the environment before you in actually interact with it. So one of the things um, just to know for people who are really into research, you know, usually we do statistical analyses based on one particular slice of time um, that you're studying, and you're only comparing within your own uh, data set. But because people were so uh, interested and upset about Daryl Bem's research in 2011, they started to talk about looking at data analysis from another perspective, which is called the Bayesian approach. And what it does is it takes the robustness or power of your particular study results and compares it to results from prior findings with results from subsequent studies. So you're sort of looking at the whole community of research, not just your own, to see how uh, standard or unusual are your findings compared to the larger collective. 
so there's also some research theory on um, what's called dual systems model. Now, dual systems model is um, two systems, hence the word dual. One of them is called system one or intuition, and this is around decision making. And so the other one is around deliberation, which is a different type of decision making. So you can think of intuition decision making as like coming to a snap decision or a conclusion kind of without your awareness, but you're just like, yeah, I'm going to go with this. Whereas deliberation is more like the, you know, taking a time and thinking about the different options. It's a much more cognitive process. Well, the first one, the intuition style of decision making is an older system in the brain and in terms of evolution of humanity, where decisions are rapid, automatic, and um, it's kind of like um, if you're running away from the tiger, like, where do you go? Do you hide? Do you go up the tree? Do you go in the cave? Do you run in circles? You kind of have to decide on the spot. And this is what happens often with someone who's super well trained as, let's say, a first responder. So they have all their skill sets where they've learned deliberately in their decision making. But in the moment when they have to, like, save the person or get out of a, a date life threatening situation, you decide on the spot what to do. And you do it automatically, rapidly. And also all the information comes in at to you at once simultaneously and nothing really has um, more um, pull um, than anything else in terms of significance. Like you may go finally with one decision but all the data comes in at once with equal weight. Now the system two deliberation style of decision making is when you take your time and really think. You're like, for example, buying a new property or going out with someone for the first time or deciding when you're going to make a major life change, um, like um, moving or uh, starting a family um, or quitting a job. And this is a newer system in terms of the evolution of the brain. It's slower than system one intuition style. Also, deliberation style has um, sequential or serial, meaning that you go from step to step to step in your thinking and your processing. And it also, though, does allow for abstract reasoning, like what could happen if I this or that or these other people come in with these decisions or how does it relate to um, other things I've learned about or theories or ideas. So it allows for going beyond the here and now. And um, these two styles are described in um, Arn Cadigan and Stickle 2017 article. So Xander found um, in their lab in 2017 that emotions are more associated with the system one or intuitive style of decision making. And that can be related to pleasant and unpleasant feeling states and also high and low arousal levels. So some research that was done um, with decision making was um, a self-study and this was in uh, Xander's et al. in 2019 their study was called it was intuitive and it felt good so this was um, 134 people that studied their lives for six days and at the end of each night they wrote down in their journal decision making that they had had during the day and so it was a retroactive study, and it was observational, and they had 3,850 observations. So people were told, you have some decisions you're going to be making each day. Some of them you're going to be thinking about in this, you know, type two of decision making. You're going to think about it. You're going to ponder. You're going to ask questions. You're going to consider, you know, all of that. And other decisions during your day are going to be intuitive. You're going to do them more on a whim or in the spur of the moment or just because. And then at the end of the day, we're going to write down in your diary um, what happened and how you reacted to it. And what they found was that people who had intuitive gut feeling decision making um, felt better before they made their decisions. And also, they preferred them over the analytical decision making, and they were in better moods. When they worked with the extensive deliberation or the analytical process of making decisions, they found that they didn't like it as much and that they didn't feel as good. 
and that they weren't as in, a good, as in good a mood. So what they found was that the people who made the intuitive decisions were more likely to feel better about their decisions compared to when they were being more analytical. They were in a better mood and they felt better before they made their decisions. So there's a tendency for us to lean into the intuitive methods. Now there's ways that you can develop this because a lot of people are not trained in how to use intuition to make decisions. There's ways that, that you can be practiced in it and learn about it. And I can tell you more about that at the end of the hour. But the, when they focus more on deliberate or analytical decision making, um, they weren't in as good a mood and they didn't prefer it as much. We learned about different types of decisions through our body systems. So through sight, sound, hearing, touch, taste, and so on. And one of the things that we focus on mostly for most people is sight. We get most of our information through our eyes. Um, sometimes it's better to close your eyes with decision making and intuition because it closes off the outside world and you can go within and focus more. But we do use a lot of information through our eyes and it tells us a lot about our world. So there's a slight tendency for women to be better at reading emotion with intuition than men. And there were some large studies that were done in 2013 to 2017. Um, there are not exactly intuition studies, they're called cognitive empathy studies, but let me read the definition of cognitive empathy to you and you'll see why I'm using this in uh, this review today. Cognitive empathy is the ability to recognize what another person is thinking or feeling and to predict their behavior based on their mental state. Once again, cognitive empathy is defined as the ability to recognize what another person is thinking or feeling and to predict their behavior based on their mental states. And so this is similar to what we would call intuition. So what they did is they took 88,000 people from the DNA sampling um, biz, uh, company called 23andMe Incorporated, and they also took uh, 1,497 people from the Brisbane Longitudinal Twin Study. And so um, this, uh, the first one was Warrior et al. 2017, the second one Kirkland et al. 2013, and in the second study this um, represented twins from 10 countries around the world and they took the data, for, uh, meta-analysis data, summary data from all these different studies. So what they found with all these people is that women were slightly better at reading emotion than men were. So they had um, photographs of pairs of eyes, of human eyes, that were emitting different emotions. And subjects were asked to rate what is the emotion that's being communicated by these eyes. And the eyes were either seen or were actually supposed to be uh, connected to being playful, comforting, irritating, or bored but you were not told what those states are ahead of time. And they found that women were better than men at detecting whether these eyes were communicating playfulness, comfort, irrit irritability, or being bored. Um, so interesting kind of study on the visual system. Another system is how accurate you are at predicting outcomes. And this is somewhat related to that Mossbridge studies that we talked about, like with the roulette game. But this one was a little bit different. This one was actually magicians. So people came into the lab and they saw a video of professional magicians performing magic tricks. But before the trick was revealed at the end, the video stops. And then the subject is asked, can you guess the ending of the trick, how it was done? Now, these subjects were never actually told the ending, nor were they told whether they were right or wrong. Most people that guessed thought that they were right. Like, how did you get the rabbit out of the hat? And they said, well, it was a different hat that they switched out, or it was a trick and there was a false bottom and the rabbit was there the whole time, or the rabbit was in a cage under the table and 
you know, they pull, they open the bottom of the hat and pull, so you can see what I'm saying. There's different solutions that you might come up with on your own as to how the trick was solved. But not all the people guessed correctly. Most people, though, thought that they were right. So when they're trying to predict the outcome of these magic tricks that were not revealed, people who guessed correctly answered faster than those who didn't. They had a stronger aha experience of feeling like they solved the problem all at once. Remember that cognitive research that shows that there's a difference between the slow, gradual um, knowing something and then the sudden aha where it comes to you all at once. And the people who guessed correctly had feelings of relief, pleasure, suddenness, and certainty. Now those who thought they were right, but actually weren't, also thought that they were correct, but they answered more slowly, and they felt more like a feeling of surprise rather than relief, pleasure, suddenness, and certainty. And so this shows us that false insights actually exist. In other words, we can be wrong, but we don't know we're wrong, but we think we're right. Now, people who think they're right about intuition or are more um, inclined to say, yes, I'm an intuitive person, or I'm psychic, or I'm able to know things without knowing why I know them. Those people were studied in the lab um, by Leach and Week in 2017. They had 323 people. And they found that those people who reported as being intuitive were actually worse at certain tasks, like learning letter strings for a certain type of grammar, than they were at social tasks. So if you remember back to the um, cognitive research that's in the laboratory, it's usually strings of words and so on that you have to memorize. But a lot of intuitive people are really good at what they do because it's related to their real life. For example, social things or things that they need to know about their world. Um, memorizing letters or strings of words is something that isn't that um, old in our system of being human. It's something that's newer. And so it makes sense that we wouldn't have a strong intuitive leaning towards more abstract things like word associations than we would to something that has real rel relevance in our life, like human interaction. So in this study, what they did is they took two different um, targets of information. One of them was the traditional um, letter strings, where you're trying to learn grammar. But then what they did is they introduced a human factor. They actually took online type profile pictures. So this is more social where you have pictures of people. But they used the same underlying grammar rules for the letter strings that they did for the online profile pictures. And they found that the people who rated themselves as being intuitive were better at the social task than they were at learning the letter strings. Reamers and Zanders in 2018 also found that the state that you're in emotionally can affect your ability to be um, better at uh, matching tasks and um, performing intuitive tasks. So they found that if you were given uh, matching tasks like deciding if images or sets of words went together or not, that you were better, people were better when they were in a neutral or positive mood than if they were anxious. And so this kind of shows that your state of mind affects how open you are to learning new information. And if so, there's a balance between the urgency of needing to know something and being overwhelmed that you're so anxious that you're actually shutting down and going into a fear state and you're not able to be uh, open to new experiences. And so the best place to be for learning new information or being intuitive is to be somewhat aroused, not really asleep, although things come in your dreams, but in the waking state to be somewhat aroused but not overwhelmed because then you can take in new information. So there's these cool studies that have been done with planarian worms. And so um, this researcher Alvarez in Spain was not originally looking to see whether planarian worms were intuitive, but he sort of happened upon it through light and sound uh, studies in his lab. So the first thing that he did is he took these planarian worms. Um, these are worms that grow under the ground, live under the earth, and they're used to uh, muffled sound and low light, if any light at all. And so they actually don't like loud sound, they uh, move away from it. Um, and then also light, also they, you know, it's, a, it's probably painful for them. 
and so they avoid light. So the first thing that he did is he was looking to see whether the um, worms were responding to noise versus silence. So he put them in a trough one at a time uh, with a, a measuring stick underneath or embedded in the trough so he could see exactly how much they were moving in what direction and he videotaped them. And then the noise was either going to turn off, turn on, so a loud noise was going to be presented, or there was going to be silence. And what he found is that the worms started to move their heads um, away from the noxious noise 10 seconds before they were exposed to it. So he's, what he's saying is, is that these worms had a sense that something was going to happen that they weren't going to want to move towards. They pulled their heads back down into their bodies or they lift their heads up and around as if they were going to be turning in the opposite direction 10 seconds before the noise actually happened. So then he did a second study with light and he had the same setup with individual worms in the trough and he was videotaping them and he could see their measurement of uh, the measurement of how much they're moving and when and he had uh, a light source that was set up on either side of the trough. So you have two lights, they're currently off, and one of them is going to light up. And that decision about which light is going to light up is made by a computer, and it's, sele it's selected by a random number generator. So the, the experimenter is not deciding which light. The random number generator decides which light is going to turn on, and it turns on for five minutes. So that's the experimental condition. In the control condition, it's the same thing as the experimental, except the light is not plugged in. So even though the computer and the random number generator are choosing which light is going to come on, the lights actually don't come on because the lights are not plugged in. So you have these little planarian worms, one at a time. There were 25 of them in the study. And so this is a within subject's control design. And they're just doing their thing in their trough, and then a light turns on. And um, Alvarez is looking to see what does the worm do. So the worm starts to move away from the light source. Now in the sound experiment it was 10 seconds before that the worm starts to move away from the noise. In the light experiment it was a full minute. A full minute before the light is going to be turned on. The worm is already moving away. Now here's the kicker. This only happens, this connection between moving away from the light source, when the human is going to turn the light on. So you have another, uh, another aspect to the study. So to review, worm is in the trough. Light's going to be turned on one end or the other of the trough. Random number, rater, random number generator pre, um, selects which light and the computer is going to turn the light on or the human is. So from the human's perspective, you get the message. It's your turn to turn on the light next and light is going to be either one or two. And so then you go and you flip on light one or light two. If you're not in part of the experiment for the human, the human is removed from it, then same thing, random number generator chooses which light. It tells the computer light one or light two, and the computer turns on light one or light two. The worm only responds when the human is going to turn the light on. And the worm is responding a minute before the selection is even made by the computer or the random number generator. So there's something in the dynamic between the worm, the human, and the computer with the light that causes the worm to avoid the light, but only when the human is involved in this experiment. So I don't know what to say about why that is, but it's interesting. And it shows that there's things going on, even in a simple planarian worm we think of as simple, um, reacting to intention or future events, it's another example of intuition. 
So to summarize, there are things that affect decision making and awareness in life. Intuition outperforms deliberate logic. In situations that are uncertain, ambiguous, or complex, or have strong emotions. And this means situations like life saving events, or relationships, or things that really get us riled up in life. It's better to go with intuition. Also, if, if the consequences are high stake or need quick decision making, and also decision making when people are emotionally unregulated, which often happens in therapy when we're talking about um, very disturbing states. If there are situations that require novelty, spontaneity, or creativity, it's also better to go with intuition than logic. And also, if you're working in the unconscious realm using implicit, nonverbal, and preverbal processing like we do with clients when you're working outside of a 3D model of reality. So another way of looking at this is that we have aspects of our life that are based in energy, and energy is the capacity for doing work. And when we're working in the physical realm, with light waves and sound waves in our physical body, we're talking about sensory energy, things that come in through our senses. And these pieces of energy move at the speed of light or slower. This is your basic 3D reality that you're taught about in physics classes and such. And it obeys natural laws of physical reality like gravity. But the subtle realm is also important with energy. And this is the non-physical energy. And these are things that aren't all that outside the norm. We just don't think of them that often. Things like thoughts or feelings. If you um, follow um, Eastern methods of healing, then you might call it chi or prana or life force. And these things move faster than the speed of light. This also includes things like dream material. It obeys quantum physics and other laws such as time travel. Like you know in your dreams that things can move um, non-sequentially. They can be here, there, and everywhere all at once. Time can move full on itself, and it doesn't follow the sequential rules that we're used to. But what's maybe less obvious is how much these things intertwine with each other throughout our day. So we receive information, we interpret it, and we transmit it to other people. And when we move from the physical to the subtle realm, for example, you speak an idea to someone and then they understand it and maybe have an emotional reaction to what you're saying. That's called releasing. So you're taking in energy from the physical and you're turning it into subtle. And when you reverse that and you start with the subtle form, like a dream or an image or a blueprint, and then you turn it into something physical, like a, an innovation or a, an object or a new way of problem solving, what you're doing is manifesting. So releasing is taking something from the physical form and moving it into the subtle realm, and manifesting is taking something from the subtle realm and moving it into the physical realm. And we do this stuff all the time. When we do it deliberately, it can be seen as um, creating physical reality. The most important thing with intuition is to listen and follow through to achieve transformation because sometimes we get intuitive information that we just ignore and um, or we put it off or we think that it's not important to listen to. But the more you do it, the more you practice, the better you are at reading the signals and the more information comes to you that you can work with. And so for the last part of this talk, we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about ethics and contraindications around uh, intuition. And then I'll end with some information about how to contact me and get more information if you're interested in learning more about intuition developing for yourself and your clients. So with ethics, let me give you an example of a situation. Let's say that you're a therapist who's new to this field and you have a client who comes in who has been studying things like intuition for a very long time and they say that they are a healer and that they come from a long line of um, people who can read energy and predict events and that they use this all the time in their life but they're coming to you for a very specific concrete reason about making a decision about whether or not to move. And so you start working with them from let's say a cognitive behavioral perspective of 
um, looking at what are they going to do and what are their decisions and what have they done in the past and what are the costs and benefits of making this decision about moving or not moving, how will it affect their finances, their love life, their family, their levels of happiness in the world and so on. And everything's coming along just great. And then they come in for another session and they say, I know that we haven't been working this way together, but I had a really important dream that came to me. I'm really shook up and I don't know what to do. And they start to tell you the dream and you realize that it's actually a dream about your life, about something really important to you. And you're not quite sure whether you should tell them that this is what they're picking up on. Now, it startles you at first, and you're not quite sure what to do with it, but as you reflect more in the moment as they're telling you the dream, you realize that it's also related to their life too, maybe in ways that they hadn't understood before, that it's some of their own personal unconscious material that's coming up. And you are sitting there trying to figure out, do I work outside my frame or not? How do I respond? How much do I self-reveal? So using this example, we're going to go through some issues that come up to think about ethically. And the first thing is relative value. Do you trust the intuitive information that's come through? Is it accurate or not? Are you projecting? Is it about their life, your life, or both? Is this information helpful? And what should you do with it? So that's one level of looking at the ethics of how to proceed. The next one is boundaries of competence. So you want to make sure that you're working within the areas that you are competent in, that you've learned about, that you've been trained in, that you've had supervision or uh, outside consultation. And so how do you proceed with that information if it's not in your wheelhouse? Do you tell the person, you know, I'm not that comfortable with this, but you might want to consult with other people? Or do you just say, you know, I don't know about your dream, but let's take it back to your life and look at the things that are coming up in your dream that might give you insight about your life? Do you go on and get more information about intuition and so on? So working within or outside your boundaries of competence. Also, what if you have some bias that's different than your client's bias around intuitive information. Maybe you have um, religious beliefs or cultural beliefs that say that um, intuitive information is dangerous. It might be upsetting to you. So do you have transference or counter-transference issues that come up in you when you're hearing the information from the client? And also, you don't want to intrude on the free will of yourself or your client. So um, you may decide to share more information or share less depending upon what is right for you and the client. In another situation, maybe you have information on intuition about a client and you're not sure whether or not to share with them. You need to find out what their worldview is before you decide to share. Also, you have to look at power differential. So if you have intuitive information about someone and they are looking up to you anyway because you're the therapist, they might give away more of their personal power than they need or ought to because they're seeing you as being so powerful and understanding things about them that they didn't know about on their own. So you have to be careful about that. Also, you need to see, is there any harm being done? For example, is intuitive information risky? Is it necessary or harmful? Is it better or worse than other options? So it may help this client in uh, analyzing their dream and how it's related to their life, not yours necessarily, um, in terms of making the decision about whether or not to move. Um, things that come to them in their own dream that they're not even aware of, which often happens. We need to sometimes have an outside mirror reflect what it is that we're coming up with because it's not obvious to us. So if you want more information about how to work with intuition and other aspects of energy, from an ethical perspective, you can go to the Association for Comprehensive Energy Psychology's Code of Ethics and Standards of Professional Practice that was published in 2013. There's also the notion of information not being from a high source or a benevolent source. So it might be uh, disturbing to some people and say, I don't want to know, you know, I think it's sorcery or from the devil or 
Um, I don't know that it's from God or from the light. And so using discernment is very important and make sure that you work within people's belief structures. And also sometimes people are um, closeted <laughs> uh, intuitives. And so what this means is that they have um, a really deep and strong knowingness about their intuitive systems, but they don't want to share it with other people because they're afraid of judgments. They're afraid of how they'll be perceived or seen or talked about or that people will want to avoid them or not trust them or that they'll be seen as crazy. And so this is something important also to explore with people should it become important in their work. You want to also see if intuitive work has caused disruptions in the past and is now unwelcome. So these are some possible contraindications. Of course, it's pretty obvious to not go against common sense or good judgment. Sometimes people believe so strongly in other ways of knowing that they give it more status than it deserves and they don't use their judgment and discernment in deciding based on intuition plus other ways of knowing like uh, past associations, deliberation, theory, um, other past experiences, like put it together as a mosaic. This is just a piece of information coming in from one channel. Lay it out with everything when you make decisions and make sure you're using common sense and good judgment and also don't go against an ethical or legal breach. In other words, don't leave your, check your brain at the door when you have a felt sense or some other intuitive connection. And as I stated before, for certain people that are in dire need, or, or don't have as much power or voice, be careful working with them. So children, the severely ill, people facing death, or persons in desperate need. For example, someone comes in and sees you because uh, their child has died and they want to make contact or have information about how to proceed. They're going to be in a very reduced state of um, internal power at that moment. And so uh, make sure that your boundaries are very clear with them. So I want to give a quick uh, explanation of um, what happens when you are almost right but not quite right about information. So um, this is a personal story that happened to me a few years ago. Um, I was going to be uh, wanting to see a play and um, the name of the play was called Hamilton. Very popular play, musical. And there was a chance of getting uh, free tickets through a lottery system. And so I was applying but not getting it. And what I heard was, you're going to spend the weekend with Hamilton. You're going to, you won't have to pay anything. The parking will be right in front and there will be a seat with your name on it. And none of that fit my physical reality of parking and so on. And it was hard to believe it was going to happen. But I kept just hearing it over and over in my own intuitive sense. So the weekend came and went almost, and uh, no tickets for Hamilton, but I did have an appointment, and so I went to the appointment, and I drove up uh, right up to the building, so I had a space right in front, and I was able to go and uh, for free. There was no charge, and when I walked in, uh, I was the last to arrive in a small group, and there was a seat left, and they said, oh, you're here. Um, th this seat it's for you. It's like it's got your name on it. And so what I realized later was one of the people who I was visiting had the last name of Hamilton. And so you can see that the information can be accurate but a little bit misplaced in our perception. And so if you have information that seems to be accurate but you can't figure out how it's fitting in, wait and look at it from a different perspective or wait until time has passed because maybe th things that you know about now aren't going to happen for 10 or 20 years, or they're going to show up in a slightly different way than you thought of. So thank you for your time during this hour of looking at some of the science behind intuition. And if you'd like to know more information, you can get a hold of me by checking out my website, which is dr, as in doctor, D-R-L-O-R-I, my first name and last name hops, H-O-P like Paul, S like Sam, dot com. So that's D-R-L-O-R-I-H-O-P-S dot com. And you can also email me at drlorihops at gmail dot com. That's D-R-L-O-R-I-H-O-P-S at gmail dot com. I also teach online and in-person developing intuition classes 
for people who want to strengthen their intuition skills. And we go through uh, a little bit of research literature, some theory, but mostly hands-on practice uh, that is personal to you, where you can practice different styles of intuitive awareness and applications to increase your own intuitive skill sets and those of your clients. Thank you so much for listening. You've just finished listening to another exclusive continuing ed podcast by Clearly Clinical. If you like what you just heard and you need continuing ed credits, please visit us at clearlyclinical.com to check out our one-year membership, where you'll have access to our growing library of continuing ed podcast courses. Clearly Clinical, where our goal is to help you learn, grow, and shine.